Hey, Revolutionaries, I'm excited to bring you this week's episode with Mark Sears, who's the founder and CEO of Cloud Factory. And as you can tell this week, I'm doing something a bit different with the intro. I don't have any bumper music in the background. And that was inspired by my conversation with Mark and how he got his company started. So a few years ago, he and his wife went on vacation to Kathmandu, Nepal, just a vacation. He had a connection there. Uh, he's from originally from Canada, so it's you know a bit of an exotic location to pick for vacation. Uh, but he was so enchanted there and started meeting people and found some folks that were interested in learning Ruby on Rails, which is a you know computer programming development language. And Mark's a technical guy, so he knew it. And so he extended his vacation and ended up staying for several years to train them up on this new software, and it created the idea for him founding this new company. This is an amazing episode, and Mark's got a great story. And in it, we talk about how travel can be a real catalyst to reinvention and to you know opening your mind and recreating yourself. And so I was inspired to leave off the, the background music and record this intro on my balcony here. I'm sitting in Wahin, Thailand right now, uh, in the right on the coast in the of the Gulf of Thailand in Southeast Asia. And so hopefully you can... Uh, you know, hear some of the sounds, and uh, I'll post a couple of pics on the Facebook page, see a couple sites of, of what it looks like here, and what the setup looks like that I'm recording at. I'm just sitting out on the balcony, me, balcony uh, of my hotel room overlooking the ocean and the beach. It's really great. Uh, but it just w- really was a reminder that travel can be a real way to help you reinvent yourself, see the world differently, and and discover opportunities that are, that are out there that you would never would have run into otherwise you know so i just wanted to share a bit of the travel experience that i'm having right now so i need to get this uh, episode edited and posted up uh, because tomorrow i'm leaving to go to kanchanaberry uh, thailand which is where the bridge over the river kwai is i'm meeting some friends up there and so we're going to have fun for the weekend so i need to get this uh i need to get this finished so so let's get to the episode with mark Welcome to Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast, the show that explores reinvention in the digital age as it relates to career, creativity, and technology. Stay tuned for interviews with professionals, entrepreneurs, and creatives that have reimagined success and are making a pivot. If you'd like to listen to the entire back catalog, visit Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution.com for instant access. And now, here's your host, Jim Jim. Hey everybody, hey, this is Jim Jim, and welcome to episode 24 of Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast, and I'm talking today with Mark Sears, who's the founder and CEO of Cloud Factory, and we're talking about outsourcing in these days of artificial intelligence and globalization. So, Mark, welcome to the revolution. Thanks, Jim. It's great to be here. Uh, Hey, well, thanks for taking time out of your day, and I really appreciate it. You know, I want to dig right into it and try to figure out Hey, are are we all going to be losing our jobs? What's going on with artificial intelligence, and why why is this a thing now in the media? I mean, this like everybody is talking about AI and how it's going to affect kind of every segment of society and such. So, what's going yeah. what's going on? And what's your what's your take on it? <laughs> oh, I, I certainly wish I had all the answers because it it is a big topic right now, isn't it? I mean, it's right. it's hitting every local national international news is is what is the future of work no mm-hmm. question exactly exactly yeah i mean I, my, my quick take on it right i mean i i think mm-hmm. i think that there's there's certainly people on on either side there's certainly people that uh are thinking that the robots are taking off taking over in the next couple of years there's there's people that think right. that um this is never going to happen and i think most of us are in the middle where we realize that we are in the midst of a drastic change, right? In the, in the history of humanity, mm-hmm. the acceleration right. of technology, specifically artificial intelligence, is, is, is happening in a way that certainly has us threatened. I mean, it, it hits at the core of all of us, right? I mean, the, the, we, mm-hmm. we've just taken work in some ways, I think having jobs uh, for granted for a long time now. And, and so that idea of... Uh, something coming along and taking that away is is hitting it's striking a chord, isn't it? It's just a, it's it's fascinating, yeah. fascinating. Well, I I think the um like we were talking earlier, you know, the the twentieth century in a way was about work or what or was about jobs, you know, and it 
made sense where it was like we had this massive economy that was expanding in the industrialization, the industrial era, where um, it kind of became like a, a, an understanding of society and life. Oh, this is what you yeah. do. You know, you kind of get a job and you go to work. And, and as long as you put in hard work, you're going to be able to, you know, live a nice life and raise your family, etc. But now when things are moving around so quickly and rapidly where the the job functions are changing a lot more quickly and the business models are changing a lot more quickly. The, I think the old concept of having uh, a job like that is different now, you know? Yeah. The, it's, it's really, a lot of it is around the, the, the speed of this change because obviously right. we, we've had a lot of revolutions, right? From the industrial revolution to even, I mean, right. I, I grew up in, in rural Canada where my family's uh, farmed and had massive you know, farmland and, and that's just changed over the last century. And, and yet we had time to adapt, right. Kind of the path from, Mm -hmm. from farms to, to white collar knowledge work. Um, it didn't happen as fast as what we're kind of faced with right now with the, with the rise of AI. And I think, I think that's what has us all is, will we have time to adjust how we educate our kids? Will we have time to, to make the shift? Um, and so I, I think that that's what what we're facing. And so yeah, it's it's a it's an important time I think for a lot of people to um, obviously stay calm, but but to, to get educated, <laughs> right. right? I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> right? Yeah, you got to get yeah, educated. Yeah, it it really is important. And I think to develop a little bit of of everyone has to have their own philosophy around it because it really from from an end consumer to almost any business, like it's going to be touching so many different aspects. Uh, of our world that that it's going to be important to figure out how to navigate um, over the next the next decade especially I think is just going to be fascinating a fascinating time to be alive is one way to think of it yeah I, I think so too and that that actually kind of leads into my next question and that you know you know I'm, I have a technical background engineering and such and so you know the term artificial intelligence or or software or algorithms or neural networks all these kinds of things you know this is just how you do business in the engineering world. It's, it's been around for a long time, right? The, you know, the concept of artificial intelligence. I was reading yeah. your, your white paper, for example, you know, that this is nothing new, but why is it moving more quickly now, I guess? Why, you know, what's happening now? And like you said, over the next 10 years, what do you see from, from where, you're, where you're standing? And we'll, we'll talk about, you know, the actual sort of crowdsourcing part here in a second, yeah. but... What do you see ramping up that's that's making this relevant now? Like we had this sort of AI spring where all of a sudden everybody's talking about it now. Yeah, everybody's yeah, yeah. It. You know, I, again, I, I don't know if this is 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 perfect um, f- perfect fact in terms of answering that question, but I think something that made it click for me was was understanding that with all of the AI research that's happened over the last few decades, there there's there's these different branches, right? So so artificial intelligence kind of at the very top. Um, there's, yeah. there's one part of that, one branch of that called machine learning. And, and then mm-hmm. under machine learning, there's, a, there's, there's a couple different branches. There's what, what's called supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Um, and, and so in particular, supervised learning, so creating these algorithms um, by actually training these algorithms with examples of, of, of kind of the correct answers. That that's this one mm-hmm. branch of research that has had massive breakthroughs over the last decade or two, and that's where you start getting into neural networks and deep learning, and 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 that is is just kind of as you kind of look at AI as the big umbrella, but there's there's a specific branch that has really really um, accelerated its development, and it's really around this idea, and that that does play into I think some of our conversation today, and that's really where where um, my company Cloud Factory has been working from is in that area of using humans to train up uh, robots, right? Or how do you have people train uh, these machine learning algorithms to perform better and better and better? And that that really is is the area that's seeing huge advancements and I think is what's got it into the mainstream press. I see. Well, you know what? I'm glad... I'm glad that I got you here now, okay? Because this this is so fascinating to me, and I think people just underestimate or are not aware that there's a, actually a massive human role or a big part of labor that plays into artificial intelligence or that plays into developing these algorithms. Because I think when people hear 
artificial intelligence, they're thinking like, oh, well, you know, my, my role as a human is over, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> yeah. what do you need me for anymore, anymore yeah. right? Because all the robots will be smart, and they're going to train themselves, and so what am I here for, and why, and why is it a good thing that we continue to create robots? I mean, it's just another way to do things, you know? I mean, it's not better or worse, it's just more efficient, I guess, is one way to look at it. But um, explain explain the labor part that goes behind it. Yeah, know? yeah, I think, it, I mean, so the 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 attempts maybe in a non technical way uh, would be described as um, these that AI can't do anything without first uh, learning it from 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 humans right like that really is the general idea is artificial intelligence is the best attempt at uh, map matching human intelligence. And so that really is the starting point, especially for machine learning, supervised learning in particular, is that these algorithms, you can kind of think at a really basic level as it's almost like a really big database where you're putting in all of the keys and all of the answers, and then the algorithm is just kind of doing a very quick lookup. So if it's, if it's, if it's seen something, um, if it's seen a million photos um, of uh, – of of cats, you know, mm-hmm. really, and then you showed another, you showed a photo and say, is this a cat? In in the most basic level, it's it's looking up in this millions of images to see if there's the closest match that it has confidence to say, yes, that is a cat, or no, that isn't a cat. So if it's only seen if it's only seen ten cats, um, that algorithm's not going to be very good. If it's seen a million cats, um, it's probably going to be pretty good. Anything beyond that, it starts to become maybe a little bit like less return, right? So you get to a point where you can be sixty mm-hmm. percent accurate, seventy percent accurate, eighty percent accurate, maybe even ninety percent accurate. But at some point, there's going to be so many exceptions, and it's like every percent after that of accuracy is really, really hard. And so, so our view of the world um, at Cloud Factory is that we get the opportunity to help train these robots, train these these algorithms to get better and better and better, um, knowing that just like software, it's never done, right? I mean, I think, mm-hmm. you know, probably 30, 40 years ago, I think everyone was creating these budgets like, oh, we need to build software, we need to build apps. And it's like, well, we'll hire someone to build it once and then once, the, once it's done, it's done. And you realize that, no, it's actually, it's actually an ongoing thing now. It's just, it's, it's, it's extremely competitive. How can we make something better and smarter and more efficient? And, and that's what we're seeing in the space. And, and so as much as, as, as much as humans are being used to create these training sets, right? So we call it training data is what gets fed in. And a data scientist creates a model um, that then creates – that then is turned into an algorithm that allows us to solve certain problems in the world. I yep. see. And, and so as that gets better and better – there, there's, there's still a gap that's there, and there's, there's actually always a gap. And so, so we see kind of on both sides of the curve, there's the need for people both to train up and make the AI smarter, but also to augment and to fill in the gap because um, there always will be a gap. There always will be exceptions and, um, and the need to kind of close the loop with humans. And so kind of on both sides, um, it's really, really important to make AI work. And then, of course, acknowledging the even bigger picture that there are certain things that artificial intelligence is has has competitive advantages, right? They just they honestly are able to compute and do things that humans will never be able to do. But there's things that humans do that technology will never be able to do. And so there's the bigger picture of humans and machines working together. But even within the machines themselves working, there's a big role to both train up the machines and to augment them. And, uh, and that's kind of our view of the world is that work is about to be completely disrupted, but it's, it's just changing. It's certainly not a matter of there being nothing left for us to do. It's just an opportunity for us to continue working on higher order things. I see. Well... Yeah, there's a, there's a couple things that you said there, which I, I, I think we can see this playing out already. So one is the, uh, in my mind, is the ongoing uh, maintenance and upgrading of software. Yep. So I, I think you're right when, you know, in the 90s when, you know, there's PCs started to be in every home, et cetera, you know, you bought your 
software on a floppy disk or on a CD or whatever, you know, you <laughs> yeah. popped it in and, and that was it. You paid your 300 bucks or $100, $100 for it and it worked and it was no big deal because it, it wasn't really interfacing with the world on a daily basis necessarily, you know, and, and the things like the internet browsers and all the interfaces weren't changing on a daily basis. Now it's kind of like any piece of software needs to be updated continually in terms of virus protection and all those kinds of yep. things. And uh, you, so you see the subscription model with a lot of the software these days, which I think makes sense because it's like it needs continual maintenance. So I, I think you're right. There is that maintenance component. And then, of course, there's the startup component of, well, we're developing the application in the first place. So that's uh, maybe more intense uh, labor up front yep. to, to develop it. So very interesting. But, yeah, it is changing. Things are changing because this is just being more, um, you know, the Internet is at scale now. These functions are at, in more demand. But let's, let's uh, what I want to do is talk a little bit more specifics about exactly what you do or what the services that you offer because you know okay people are like all right all right you help train uh, you know ai software what does that mean <laughs> what does that mean to the average guy what's actually the job function yeah. you know like it sounds good in, in concept and theory but you're like what what would i be doing if i'm the guy that's going to be helping you or working for you yeah right? yeah well i mean I, I think obviously a good place to start is, is the name right so cloud factory really was born out of out of this this idea of what what would a digital factory in the cloud look like because we we see that factories and and really efficient production in the in the physical world has been what's really changed a lot of economies um it's it's what's developed country after country um from from the u.s to china to korea to on and on and on and and so the 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 origin of cloud factory actually goes back to a trip that my my wife and i took in 2008 to uh to Kathmandu, nepal and uh, we were there on a two-week vacation, really just out of some relationships that we had and, and just the opportunity and desire to travel and see the nation. And, and we fell in love. We absolutely fell in love with the people and the beautiful country of Nepal. And we ended up actually just extending that trip um, and, and staying and living for six years and, and, and actually having our two, our wow. two beautiful kids there and, and really consider it home. Really? In many ways, yeah. Wait, yeah. wait, wait a second. Wait a sec. Wait, wait a second. Okay, so let's back this up one one second because I didn't I didn't know this part, part about your background. It's very interesting to me because I'm starting to travel more and kind of kind of get into the this notion of kind of just really trying to see the world differently yeah. and you know kind of opening my mind to continually you know reinvent myself as time yep. moves on here, which I think we all need to. You know, that's you know you know obviously the impetus for the for the podcast yep. here, but. Wait, so you, you get this idea, I'm going to go to Nepal for a couple of weeks, you know, get away, and that's kind of an exotic destination. Sounds like you had some connection there, and that's why you came up on your radar screen. Not everybody from uh, Canada thinks like, hey, i got to <laughs> get to Nepal someday, <laughs> right? That's true, that's true. Uh, or from North America, I guess, yeah. you know. Um, but did you have any idea when you went over there that you were going to stay? Did you come back and then... You know, did you have this two week no. vacation? Then think, well, let's come back someday, or you just never left once you yeah. got there. What, tell me yeah, yeah, no, no, it really was as crazy as um, a two week vacation, and we we had no intention, uh, certainly no intention of of staying any longer. But we we really we fell in love. We we spent some time out in the village parts of Nepal, and you know, I think there's this desire. So my wife's a chartered accountant. Um, you know, I'm a computer science mm -hmm. uh, entrepreneur turned on software entrepreneur, and you know, you're just like how, like this is, place is amazing, and yet the 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 economic financial poverty and and just some of the things that we saw, we just wanted to help, and yet felt so ill-equipped. And, and then we we came back towards the the last part of our vacation into Kathmandu, and um, uh, I ended up getting getting introduced to some some really good young computer engineers, and and so I'm sitting I'm oh, sitting okay. there. Was that through your connection? It was, yeah. It was that, yeah. So, so we actually, you know, uh, the full story, which is important actually for the history, you know, of, of why we're doing what we're doing, is so we we had been um, we had an opportunity to go to uh, the Middle East. My wife had a job opportunity there, and um, some of my two of my best friends were were Nepali guys, and we learned a lot about mm -hmm. Nepal. But probably the biggest thing we learned and and really kind of tugged on our heart was that uh, they would 
come and work for two years away from their families, away from their homes, and they'd go back to Nepal for two months, and they'd come back and work for two years, and they'd be in this cycle. And so, so my friend was actually heading back to Nepal to visit and to visit his family and actually meet his two-year-old son for the first time. Oh, wow. So, so for us... Just the the reality of that of going back with him and seeing his son and and just experiencing the reality of of a place that you know has like sixty plus percent unemployment was 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 very impactful and 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 to know that my friend and so many people that we began meeting including so he introduced us he's like oh you're a computer geek I've got some friends that are computer geeks why don't you guys meet and and so it was through that meeting that you know we started to realize. Um, like, like, how could we help? And and one of the things these these computer engineers wanted to learn is they were interested that I'd been working with Ruby on Rails, a particular uh, computer programming uh, framework, um, for for a few years, and and they wanted to know if if uh, if I could teach them. And and so I literally just sort of looked at my calendar and said, well, I could probably stick around for a few weeks and and train you guys if you wanted to. And and so so it was literally. A change of the ticket for three weeks to stay. I bought an iMac uh-huh. and started, you know, training in the mornings. Um, oh wow! Because you didn't have any gear with you necessarily, no, right? You're on vacation. I was on vacation. <laughs> I was absolutely on vacation, and oh, that's crazy. And uh, so, so yeah, it started. It started really. It went from a vacation to training to mm-hmm. while I'm there, people are asking, "Hey, where are you?" I'm like, "Oh, I'm actually still in Kathmandu and training up some some guy, uh, some guys on Rails." And they're like, "You've got Rails developers." These guys are like unicorns. Can you do a project for us? And uh, <laughs> and right. so you know, it, it really started from that point. It, it turned into a project, and then another project. So it it was it was vacation to training to projects to a business, and um, you know, it really it was 2010 where we we recognized the need um, for a technology platform to to do a lot of this routine repetitive work. Um, at scale and to do it accurately, uh, we'd seen things like Amazon Mechanical Turk out there, which is is fascinating and really kind of been the the father or grandfather of this of this space, right? This idea of being able to send work to the cloud or to the crowd and get it back in in minutes. Um, and and just that that idea was so fascinating. And yet, as we began trying to use that as a team, we realized. It just wasn't delivering on both sides, both the customers and the people doing the work. We just felt there was fundamental challenges, both in kind of the the way that the marketplace was set up, and the way that the the technology worked, and the just just the experience of on both sides of the the two sided marketplace. And so, in 2010, we started building uh, Cloud Factory as a new platform to get work done in the cloud. And and so it was it was kind of at that point, obviously, we didn't know. Uh, that the AI arms race and machine learning was going to be driving massive, massive, desperate need for this work. Really, at the at, when we started, and until still to this day, it was really looking at kind of the the old school outsourcing, right? So we saw outsourcing on one right. side, right? But like you know, these big companies that were just pure wage arbitrage, you know, throwing work over the wall and hoping it came back done well. And obviously it, it didn't usually, it was very manual. Right. Uh, like I said, we, we just very old school. And then the other side is a lot of these tech companies that were emerging with these all tech platforms that really weren't thinking about the workers and, and what would these new jobs look like and how would we really create an experience um, and, uh, so, so yeah, we, we had some pretty opinionated, uh, thesis on, uh, how we could do this better. And, and that's really what we did. We started building a platform. We launched at TechCrunch Disrupt in 2011. We started with 25, what we call cloud workers. We put them in teams of five and built a team-based mm-hmm. model where it's kind of a semi-distributed, where they have the flexibility to work from wherever, but they still, um, have to work within an hour of one of our delivery hubs. Um, which which exist right now in Kenya and Nepal. And so they come in for interviewing and orientation. They come in for training and uh, and then they, they they meet in these teams of five, you know, every week. And and, and so we, we designed what we believe is 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 like a great gig, right? We want to be the best gig wherever we operate. And and we know that involves you know, involves people obviously earning good money. It involves, you know, flexibility and, and that they need to be learning, they need to be growing. 
and and so just really that whole crafting that experience into a a job that is remote that still has relationship and you identify with something um, that's really what we've been working to do at cloud factory and and so what that what that's done is it's created you know it's grown from from 25 to 250 to you know over 2500 cloud workers today in the and kenya and um, so we're we're in a place where we've got a technology platform we've got a great workforce that really cares about doing good work they're engaged they're mm-hmm. mostly 20 somethings that you know, are, are, are finishing college or are recent graduates. And it's often kind of a, it's a, it's a great entry level job. And, and so all that's allowed us to now come in and provide, especially other technology companies who are looking for a new way, a better way to get routine repetitive work done. And they want to be able to just like they have access to Amazon Web Services and cloud computing say, I just want to spin up more servers. I want to spin up more storage. Like it should just be easier. The the user experience should just be super easy. Just turn a dial and get more get more storage, get more server capacity. But we also are trying to create that experience for them to get more um, uh, capacity in terms of getting work done. And and so mm-hmm. that that's really the experience what we call cloud labor is the ability for companies to spin up remote teams to work with them, to collaborate with them, to to feel like it's an extension of their own team where they can get all sorts of routine repetitive work done, but they don't ever have to worry about uh, the the you know this the hassle of of finding and and hiring and training and managing and paying and just a lot of that stuff. Very similar to how you know most most companies now have their servers in the cloud and they 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 never see those servers. They never have to change a hard drive or or pay the electricity bill. Um, that that's right. that's really the, this factory in the cloud that we've created to try and help these tech companies accelerate, uh, focusing on what they do best, um, so that they can innovate. They can they can develop the next amazing AI that's going to change this world. Wow. Well, that's well. I think it's really uh, like we were talking before, just a great sort of niche and application that you stumbled upon here because it's sort of like it's the right thing for the right time. Yeah. You know, it just reminds me of, you know, like I've been in the automotive industry and in the, you know, the high tech uh, world uh, and the fiber optic world. And, you know, there's a lot of outsourcing that goes on there, but it's outsourcing for, you know, hand assembly and factories. And, you know, this is not a new idea, yeah. but this is sort of the new spin on the new connected world that we live in, the new digital world that we live in. And, you know, these sort of freelancing opportunities and virtual assistant opportunities have been out there. Uh, but more on a small scale basis and, you know, people have kind of understanding those ideas, but it sounds like this is really meeting now this massive need for just the labor component in a way of, for the artificial intelligence applications that are happening. Maybe we could talk about what those applications are so people can have a better understanding of why the labor is yeah. required. Like what's really going on? You know what I mean? Like wh- who are the types of customers that you're working for? What are the types of things that they're looking to get accomplished. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll give I'll give three really quick examples and maybe we can dig in on, on one of those. Um, sure, kind sure. of the three buckets of, of companies that are really excited about using Cloud Factory. One is is that kind of traditional business process outsourcing. So or at least a replacement of that. So we, we have one one uh-huh. client, a very large insurance broker in the US. You know, you see their ads on TV and they they uh, they're they're quite big and they, they have a huge call volume and, and as part of managing that call volume in a, in a very regulated industry of insurance, you need to actually audit those calls and you have to really ensure that you're documenting, you know, what was said or wasn't said in terms of those, those calls. And, and so, so that's a use case that we've had, uh, you know, we scaled up with, with a client that came and just said, okay, we, we have this volume of calls and we can integrate together so that, um, we can have we can spin up so we we call it cloud factory we call it a work stream so you spin up a work stream to basically audit these phone calls and basically listen to them identify look for certain things that are said or aren't said and kind of check the appropriate boxes on on a compliance um, checklist um, so so that's again certainly not anything new but right. we're doing it in a way that is actually more more efficient, more integrated, and feels more like an extension of their team, opposed to again just kind of throwing it over the wall as as outsourcing. The, the second one 
is a lot of our customers are SaaS platforms. So software as a service you mentioned earlier, right? The subscription. They've got platforms that are uh, <clears throat> mostly technology, but there's certain features that actually need to have people within them. So kind of combining that human and machine uh, intelligence together to create a great user experience. And so one of those examples would be a company called Expensify, right? A really great company. It's growing very fast. It's very simple. You know, you download their app and you take photos of your receipts and it automatically populate, populates your expense reports. So um, it's, a, it's a very simple but very, very useful idea and they've executed it so well. And, and a key part of what they do is, is taking that photo and then literally knowing with confidence that you can scrumple up that receipt and throw it away. Um, well, those receipts do come up and, and using a combination of technology and and a Cloud Factory work stream, they're able to pull all that information off and, and get it into your expense report. And so that's kind of a, a real-time thing where we have operators in Nepal and Kenya that are pulling off that information, um, you know, every minute of the day. Um, the third one, which is is obviously the most relevant for today, is – within machine learning and how do you create training data to uh, train up AI algorithms. And and so a really big space for us in that is, is autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars. And and so we've got, we've got um, uh, you know, more than 10 customers right now in that area of autonomous vehicles. Um, it's an arms race right now. It's amazing. The billions of dollars that's being invested into this space is just fascinating. And, 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 and from our position, it's always great to kind of see really under the hood and see what everyone's doing, where everyone's at. And, and it, it, it really is an interesting time specifically in that market. And, and really what that looks like is you've got these cars that are going down the road. Um, they've got sensors that are – cameras essentially that are sitting you can think maybe six in a car right two on the front on the side on the back mm -hmm. and as they drive down the street they're they're gathering all this video footage and what we're doing is they're they're using their cloud factory work stream to actually tag and annotate all of those images almost frame by frame to actually identify within within the within the the snapshot photo what is a car? Where are the lanes? Is there a tree? Is that a dog? All of that information, <clears throat> we have to actually label and even draw bounding boxes and uh, and color in to to help essentially train the computers on on how to create how to basically see and know what exactly is there because otherwise it's just images with no information, right? There's no way that an algorithm right. can identify. The only way they do that, again, is by this training to say 100 times, that's a dog crossing the street, or this is an intersection, or that's a stop sign, et cetera, et cetera. So all of that information that's being captured has to be labeled in a way that's going to use that data to, to help the car to know how to drive itself. Wow. I mean, that's <laughs> I, this, this is what I really wanted to get get across here is that it's so crazy to me to think that all this artificial intelligence, it's super high tech, has this major human labor component behind massive. it. Massive. Yeah. You know, that's it's that and that it's at this massive scale. It's it's so wild to even think about that that's really what's what's happening and what's helping drive and move forward the applications. You know, like I'm thinking about that, you know, expense report kind of application like you know, when I was working in the corporate world, that would have been very useful for me. <laughs> I don't have to do that so much anymore. But uh, just knowing that, uh, yeah, that there's this guarantee that, you know, you know, you can't just rely on optical character recognition, for example. You know, someone's got to decide how did the optical character recognition software get so intelligent, you know, that there's this feedback and continual feedback, like you said, uh, on, on an ongoing basis when, when the environment keeps changing, et cetera. Yep of what's really going on. Well, that's, uh, I mean, it's wild stuff. So it, it, so it's, it sounds like it's been just growing like wildfire. I didn't realize you had, you said about 2,500 people now that you're uh, managing that you're, is part of, part of Cloud Factory, the services? Yeah, yeah. So so we, we, we have our, our core team is just over 200 people, right? So that's, you know, everything from uh -huh. 40 plus engineers and sales and marketing operations, et cetera, et cetera, people that are overseeing our projects and our, and our workforce. So that's our, our full-time core team. But then, yeah, in terms of cloud workers, our, our cloud team is, is uh -huh. 2,500 and, and growing very, very quickly and and so yeah together as as one team obviously we're we're very excited that we've we've tapped into 
providing um, a better a better offering, right? A better a better product um, in a, in a space that's really really growing fast. And and so there, the, the the key things I think that we're seeing is that. Technology companies, they, they, they want to work in a very efficient way. They want it to be agile, flexible. They need to be able to scale. Um, all of those things is, is what we've really optimized Cloud Factory for, and I think that's what's kind of resonating. And, and so um, it's, uh, it's fun for us. I mean, again, really the reason we exist as a company uh, is on both sides, right? We, we, we love the ability to help companies innovate and innovate faster and scale that innovation. Uh-huh. But we, we, what we really love to do is, is we call creating meaningful work. And so dating back to the beginning of the company, why, why we started the company and what really drives us today is we get so excited about getting to, um, every time we bring on a new client, that's, you know, that's dozens or hundreds of, of new workers that we get to give a, an opportunity to. That, that's really, I think, as a company, what we love to do is we, we are a tech company, so we love to innovate. We love to help our, our clients innovate, but we especially love when it creates new opportunities for people who probably wouldn't get it necessarily otherwise. And uh, so that, that's, that's what we're having fun right doing right now is, is – uh, is really seeing kind of the value created on both sides of the marketplace. And, um, and so we're kind of entering that fun stage of, of beginning to scale things up. Right. Well, I, yeah, I think that's the real fun stage. That's the real interesting stage, I guess, or situation that I'm, I'm seeing in the world where, you know, historically you think about outsourcing as, yeah, it's just this wage arbitrage kind of situation, but with the types of services and the type of work that's out there, that is, that, you know, can be cloud-based, can be home-based from anywhere. Yep. It's really giving these populations different opportunities than than they never would have had in terms of the technical um, skills you can develop, and those skills are valuable, and they're valuable everywhere. Yeah, right? yeah, that's I think that's what we're seeing. I mean, it's certainly entry-level work. We don't necessarily want to see our workers stay with us for, you know, for for a decade, right? It's it's really meant right. to be like more of a stepping stone. But we've already we've already in the last few years we've seen many of our cloud workers, um, you know, first and foremost come on to join our full-time team, right, our core team. So we've got. I think something right. like a third of our team actually started first as as our cloud workers, and they've they've been uh-huh. promoted into full time teams, uh, um, looking after client projects or supervising uh, teams of workers, um, engineers, you name it. Um, but but then also going on to start their own businesses, to um, go abroad to, for, for further study. To to yeah. Uh-huh. So it's 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 a fun part for us, for sure, when we see our cloud workers go on to do bigger and better things, that's, that's part of success for us. Yeah, that's, that's great. It's really, it's very interesting to me. I'm not, <laughs> I mean, it's just kind of wild to, to think about all of this has happened, you know, just really in the last, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, it's just uh, this massive explosion of connectedness and opportunity. Exactly. Uh, you know, I, I mean, a company like yours or your, vi- you know, the vision of, that you had of just, kind of going over there and staying and wanting to share your your technical expertise with these guys that were really interested in develop, developing themselves. I mean, that's that's pretty fascinating. It's got to be very, very rewarding, you know? It's yeah, great. yeah, it is. I mean, I, I, the, the thesis that it comes from a, a quote that's been out there for quite a while, but it's that talent is equally distributed around the world, but opportunity is not. And and that's exactly what I saw back in 2008 when I went to Nepal, and I, we saw it when we went to Kenya a few years later. We, we've now expanded and are growing very very fast there, and we continue to look um, at other places for us to continue expanding to build the world's workforce. We believe that that there's so many people that are talented out there that aren't that have gone through. They've got a great education. Um, they're connected. They're online. They're they're ready and willing to contribute to the global economy, and and uh, and so we're we're trying to create a, a platform and a way for them to do that. And um, it's uh, it's fun. Yeah, I, I mean, our hope is that outsourcing uh, is no more. Right. We we certainly think that you know there's, there's such a such a spectrum now between people who have full time employees, and then sometimes those employees are working remotely. And and right. then and then you've got outsourcing, right? Which is obviously a, a bigger arms like distance distance away. But we're trying to find that middle, right, between kind of your your full time core team, um, and 
outsourcing, we believe there's a middle ground, which again is very much the, the, the feeling and experience that cloud computing and cloud storage offers is it feels like it's your own. You have control and visibility over it like it's your own, but you, you don't have to worry about all the same hassle and pain. Um, and so that, that, that's what we believe is, is – that's how a lot of our teams are operating now is, is they're constantly um, connected via real-time chat and they're working with their teams like their internal teams, like they're an extension of their own team instead of um, kind of defining this very clear uh, interface to just outsource work and – Companies can't afford to do that anymore. Like it's just, it's not agile and flexible enough. People can't go through these cycles of trying, trying to get that outsourcing relationship to work. You don't even know if it works for for six or twelve months, and then if it doesn't work, right. you got to go and search and find and start all over again. And and the companies that we deal with can't afford those year long cycles. They have to choose companies that are going to really be more of a trusted partner and really b- provide the technology and the approach that makes it feel like an extension of their own company because they're just they're moving too fast to uh, to operate in an outsourcing world right well it makes makes a lot of sense so a- a- as we go along here we got a, we got a, a few minutes left but uh, there's a couple of questions I want to I want to ask you before we get out of here is now that you you see this new world and you see it coming together you like you know, five or ten years from now, do you have any idea how things will look differently? Do you think it's going to be, let's say, you scale up, you know, Cloud Factory or these these types of offerings? Is it going to continue kind of in this vein, or or how do you see the world being connected like ten years from now, for example? Yeah, I mean, I th- I think that there's there's obviously, like you said, globalization. There's um, the the rise of of internet access in places, kind of the last third of the world. There's there's a lot of economic and political. I mean, there's so many things that are happening right now. It is it is fascinating to see what's going to happen in the next uh, in the next decade. But I, I mean, I think some of the key things that that we anticipate we we are very much. I would say we're very very bullish on on people, right? I mean, I think that. As much as technology is improving, it, it is really, in the end, it needs to help us. It needs to help people. And it's not about, yeah, it's not about trying to compete. There's things that we just we just won't be able to compete with, but there's things that just, that, that are never going to be replaced. And so, so I, I think... I think where we're where we're heading, you know, is is more of a flat world. I mean, we, you know, Thomas Friedman put out the book, you know, about a flat world, but the world is not yet flat. It is flattening, but it's certainly not yet flat. And so I think this next decade we're going to see more and more of that. There's going to be more and more competition, more competitiveness. Um, there's going to be a shift in jobs that's going to have people, you know, desperately holding on, trying to find. Uh, you know, trying to keep their job, and and that's going to be hard. I mean, it, it is a reality that there's there's technology, and there are people on the other side of the world that are both fighting for jobs that are being done today, and and so that's the reason it's in the mainstream press, and it's reason to be alert and to be thinking about it. But uh, we certainly are very bullish that people are going to continue to drive. Um, work and 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 be the leader of work for uh, forever, uh, and they're going to continue to be a really big a really big part of getting that work done themselves. And so we're, we're we look at the paperless office, right? The promise of the paperless office thirty plus years ago. I'm sitting here uh-huh. with paper on my desk right now. Right. I don't know about you. Um, there's been you know there's been huge strides, but we certainly are not yet paperless offices. We even look back at the whole autonomous vehicles. I always laugh. Uh, we recently moved to to the UK to help open up our office here, and um, so coming coming to to Europe and seeing that most cars are still manual. They're still manual, and it's like, well, the the, the automatic transmission oh, right. was uh-huh. developed 50 years ago. And so if we as humans can't trust the car to change gears for us, um, are we really psychologically ready to just hand over all driving of the car? Right. I mean, I, that, I think that's what we're facing. Right? Is 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 technology is going fast, but what about the the legal, the liability, the um, political, the insurance? I mean, there's there's so many things that are going to still have to be worked out, and so all that together, uh, I think the next decade there's just going to be a lot more news. <laughs> I think that's one thing. 
I think it's the one thing we <laughs> right. count on is that uh, it, it's just going to get it's going to get hyped <laughs> and it's going to be more and more in our faces and we're going to get more case studies and you know I think it's going to be important for us all to to take it in stride and uh, and begin to adapt. I mean, for me, I was at a conference and someone mentioned the idea of of my kids five and eight years old never learn need, never needing to learn how to drive, and I just I stopped and thought right. about. I'm like. I'm like working in this space and yet I've never really thought that I won't be teaching, you know, my, my son and my daughter how to drive. That's just and then I'm like, yeah, that's that's a fascinating right. thing to think about. But I, I uh-huh. definitely a possibility. Most most people would would not say that's the case, I think, at this point. Right. So the idea of this happening in the next, you know, in my case, next eight years, um, you know, there's there's definitely there's definitely huge advances, but for us to get to a place of, of what's called level five, auton- fully autonomous driving, most people are kind of looking at, you know, 2030 and beyond before that's a reality for, for multiple reasons. Nobody knows, but um, yeah, it's, 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 it, it's, we're, we're giving more and more control over to computers when it comes to things like driving, right? It started with cruise control and, automatic transmissions and now we've got assisted parking and we've got you know collision avoidance and helping us stay in the lanes and you know it's 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 fascinating there's there's more and more um but uh, i think there's still some time yet some time left yeah well well i agree and there's there's just that human factor of you know is the market going to accept it or not i mean there that's that's like you're mentioning the you know the manual transmissions in europe the uk i mean it's just kind of just a cultural thing you know, this is what they like to drive over there and, and vice versa here in the U.S., it seems. But uh, and, and I, I like your point of like, you know, the paperless office, like, you know, I've been in technology a long time. And, you know, there's always been these kind of reports over the years of, you know, robots replacing jobs and all these kinds of things. Like when I worked for General Motors, it was in the 80s. It was a big time when robots, you know, companies like Fanuc out of France and such, uh, you came in and they, they bought a lot of robots for their, uh, you know, assembly lines. And of course, it changed the labor equation, but it opened up this massive uh, jobs for you know the guys programming the robots, for the maintenance for the robots, for all this other stuff that goes along with it. You can't just put in a robot, you know, like and think it's going to work on its own. So it's uh, and same thing with copy machines and all the stuff and faxes. You know, it's all going to go paperless. But it's like, yeah, we've I've never had to dealt with more like paper in my life in a way of uh, reading reports and such, but. Uh, yeah, it's just kind of the way the the world turns. It's just the, the key is it's going to be different, I think, and that's the thing to keep an eye on and to you know stay alert, stay aware, stay aware of in terms of your own personal kind of you know job function or business model that you're working in. So, well, this is it's awesome, man, to learn about this stuff. It's great to kind of see what's really happening behind the scenes. So, uh, one more question before I, before we get out of here is, you know, you're one of these people that are out there that are reinventing you know, business models, reinventing the way people work, et cetera. But how do you, on a personal level, how do you maintain your outlook or how do you keep reinventing yourself? Because this is this is mind-blowing to go over there and all of a sudden stay in Nepal an extra few weeks and then all of a sudden create a company out of it. I mean, that's pretty wild in terms of just what your mindset is. So what's one tip or two that you can give people to continually just look at the world and, you know, take advantage of, of how it's spinning? I think I think one thing for sure, and you mentioned it yourself, is is traveling, right? It really it, there's there's something about um, getting into different cultures and different places, and and even seeing uh, some some of the different trends. If that's if that's technology or consumer trends or business trends, it's it's amazing what you can pick up from a few days. Um, Heading to a different to a different country, and so so I think that's one thing for us is, is we've had the opportunity to to live and work in a few different countries now, um, as part of this cloud factory journey, and so 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 I think there's there's some some cultural intelligence, there's some soft skill stuff, there's some hard skill stuff of getting to see some different places, um, and 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 where they're at from a technology perspective. So, so I think that's a great practical one, um, and everyone loves loves. Well, most people love to travel, and so there's a little bit more of a uh, of a of a reason to do it. Um, I think I think the other thing, um, you know, is is uh, for me the learning cycle, the learning engine. Everyone has their own personal learning engine, and it looks different, and it it changes. Right, we are at different stages of our careers, and and, and with our families as well. Like I said, I've got two small kids, and 
And so it's it's really it's 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 actually focusing on that learning engine um, more than even necessarily on on what you're you're learning at any particular time. And so so for me, it's 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 what are you consuming and how are you consuming it? And so right now, it looks like uh, I've got a longer commute than I've had in many years. And so uh, I'm loving Audible and and I'm plowing through audiobooks and podcasts and. Uh, and and that's a big part of of my learning engine right now is is kind of uh, the to and from the office, um, and uh, you know it used to look like before it was a lot more reading of blog articles and stuff like that. So I, I think it's I think it's it's focusing on on that learning engine and making sure that we we keep that going and of course who we're surrounding ourselves with. So I've I've just been surrounded by such amazing people and. Literally, we're on four continents now with, with the U.S. office, U.K. office, Nepal, and Kenya. And, and just to see the diversity um, and just amazing people that I get to work with every day is, is a huge part of what's allowing me to continue to, to learn and grow to be able to navigate uh, the ever-changing field that we're in. Well, uh, awesome, awesome tips. And I, li- I like this, uh, this term, learning engine. I don't know if I've ever thought about that for myself to apply to my own <laughs> thought process the learning engine that's i love that uh it's kind of a key phrase that I'll, i'm sure i'll stick with me yeah traveling and and listening to podcasts and um yeah which is a, this whole crazy new you know sort of art form and information form which is uh, amazing it's one of the things that you know i got drawn to doing the podcast in the first place is you can learn so much in such a short period of time now so it's another thing that's really affecting the the world and We'll push things forward. So, anyways, Mark, uh, thanks so much for for being on the show today. If people are interested more in you know reaching out to you or contacting you or learning more about Cloud Factory, how do how do people get in touch? Well, with you? first and foremost, you can you can find out more at cloudfactory.com. You can uh, hit me up on Twitter. It's just at Mark T Sears. Or more than happy if anyone's got anything uh, of direct interest to just reach out at Mark M E R K at cloudfactory.com. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks again, Mark. I really appreciate it. Okay, thanks, Jim. Thank you for listening to Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast. If you want to hear more, join our mailing list at jimjimsreinventionrevolution.com. See you next time. And remember, the revolution has just begun. So dig in, embrace the process of reinvention, and start realizing the success you've always dreamed of.